in dentistry and nasal obstruction. Um, in the last lecture, we talked um, uh, about the more classical abnormal and tonsil sort of situation. And from my experience, I think Larry may or may not agree with this, but there's a lot more children who are nasally obstructed because of allergies and anything else. You know? So you get the classical large adenoids, large tonsil kid, you know, the adenoid face, who's going to be a mouth breather and uh, develops a narrow palate. And for speech pathologists here, they're your classical lower tongue position type patients because there's no room for the tongue. Um, for me as an orthodontist, they're the kids who develop the narrow palate and don't have room for their teeth. And in the traditional approach, we would be addressing those issues by extracting teeth. Now the more modern approach is to develop the palate. And um, developing the palate has the added uh, benefit of improving the nasal breathing in a lot of the studies that we can chat with, um, and also making more room for the tongue after the expander comes out, right? So, um, and that's an important point. Like, um, I get a lot of patients referred to me, uh, uh, pediatric kids who are on CPAP. And um, I work with Jim Papadopoulos, who some of you may or may not know. And, and the important thing is, during the expansion phase of therapy, their apnea worsens. Why? Because in the average expander, the tongue is pushed downward and backward. So they still need the CPAP while you're doing the expansion. But then the goal is, if you expand their jaw and you bring it forward, um, you help improve their airway. And that works for a lot of kids. So what I've asked um, uh, Larry to talk about uh, today is common forms of nasal obstruction, how you diagnose it, what tr uh, effective treatments there are, particularly with to allergies. Um, Larry, if I get this right, heads the unit at Concord Hospital and also has a private practice um, uh, in Edgecliff Centre. Uh, and operates out of um, East Sydney Hospital, which is probably the greatest place to park, with the Aldi downstairs. Right? Um, and he's really, really good uh, with, um, e even other ears and throat doctors that I know will refer to Larry when they tried method A, B, and C, and the kid has still got uh, a lot of uh, nasal obstruction concerns because he seems to hit the nail on the head. He's sort of, I can't say part-time academic, but I don't know what percentage of academic these days, He's got a great grasp of the literature, but the, how the literature relates to actual clinical uh, things. So that's, I think, always refreshing to use it. So can I give you this? And um, Larry have you answer questions sort of throughout the lecture, but because we've got other people listening, it might be good if we could just wait at the end and then they can bring the, the sort of uh, phone, sorry, the camera thing. So, um, one option is for the people who are on at the other sites, maybe they could SMS one of you to ask questions. So we, we actually run webinars as the CBD portion, which is a good way to do this, and uh, we get people to SMS us questions. So if there is anybody at the other sites and you want to interrupt and ask a question, feel free to uh, SMS it. Is there an SMS you can give them maybe, or a, a number, a mobile, somebody who's keeping about their mobile? So thank you very much. Uh, it's really an absolute pleasure always giving talks uh, for Gary because I really think he's not an outstanding educator, but I think he's one of those uh, really collaborative uh, uh, specialists who we actually work together. And the thing that I love the most about what I do as an ENT is that we actually get the opportunity to work with multiple other disciplines. And I find that every time I work with other disciplines, I learn more. And uh, you know, we always like to say we like to steal from others, uh, do the research, prove it's right or wrong, and if it's right, then we take ownership of it. Um, so I'm a part-time academic, I just have a good academic interest, I've got a Master's of Epidemiology, so I actually know how to do research, and I work in a group of like-minded uh, academic minorologists uh, <coughs> uh, through St. Vincent's, headed by Professor Richard Harvey, with Professor Ray Sachs, myself, and Dr. Rowan Campbell, as well as uh, Social Professor Janet Rimmer, and we run a, a research group, so I have the pleasure of, uh, of them having uh, doctoral students and postdoc students and a whole bunch of ILP students and honours students who run a whole bunch of projects for us. And it's humbling because you know, they also get into your practice and they use your data. And the one thing about other people going through your data is that it's the best audit in the world. Because when you look at your own data, you look at it with you know, rose-colored glasses. But when you get somebody else to look at your data, it's, it's much more humbling. So I always like to say whenever we talk about anything, <coughs> you see, you've got to be careful, obviously, when we talk about information. Because as doctors, we obviously used to give a lot of good information. You know, we promoted smoking. 
Uh, we told mothers that Coca-Cola was wonderful and very good for babies. Uh, I mean, this has got to be a great idea, you know. Why wouldn't tapeworms be good for weight loss? Right? Makes sense to me. I can assure you now that I've often thought of about giving my kids cocaine for, for not just aches and pains and toothaches. And probably they'd be going a little bit far when we start offering beer to babies. But the reasons that I show you this is that historically we have given advice which we thought was right, and when we retrospectively look at it, it's not so correct. And I've no doubt that 10 years from now you might be thinking about some of the things I tell you today and say, what a crazy guy, did he really actually said that? But at the same token, a lot of the things that we do, and I tell my colleagues all the time, we've been doing for 50 years. So maybe it's about time to really look back and say, are we doing it correctly? So don't only think about, you know, always question everything you do, but also question the things that you think of, of, of practice that people have been doing for years and years. So what we're talking about today is really pediatric nasal obstruction, block nose. And a block nose is really a subjective feeling of obstruction. Or you can objectively assess the nasal, uh, you could do rhinometry, nasal spiky peak flow, you could image it, or you could do validated scores like the nose score. And it's quite easy to see if the nose is blocked in an adult. We could have a good look here at what's called a thudicum speculum, and it's quite obvious, I think, hopefully to everyone in the room, that that septum bends over to the left, and it's very difficult to get airway. So if you look in his nose there, you can see that it's quite obvious that that septum is prominently bent to the left, and he's not going off. But sometimes it's not that clear. So this is a lady, and if you look very closely, you'll see that she has complete obstruction at the back of her nose, because she has what's called a coanal atresia. Okay, she's 58 years old, with a complete nasal obstruction on the side, and she never something she was born with. Very unusual, very <coughs> unilateral. Most times babies are born with that for coanal atresia, which is actually a medical emergency, because babies are obligate nasal breathing. They have to breathe through their nose. So if she came with a complete nasal obstruction on the left side of her nose, what side of the nose do you think she complained to us about? The right. And that's why. 100%, exactly. So she's never breathed through the left side of her nose. So she only recognises that the right side was fluctuating obstruction. And in fact, that first guy with the severe deviation on the left and she also came to me and said, my nose is blocked on the right. And it was hard to believe that it was his nose. And that is because variation of airflow is important. But then you get a patient like this. This lady is a diabetic who presented with invasive fungal sinusitis. So she came to us, she was uncontrolled diabetes, she had fungus growing through her sinuses, probably started from a sort of fungal ball or mycetoma, and we had to go in and debride everything. So we removed everything possible in her nose, all the way back to optic nerves at the back of the apex. And this is her, thankfully, well, we didn't save her life. I think the endocrinologist probably saved her life by controlling her diabetes, let her body deal with the infection, but we gave her the time for them to do that. But she comes back about five years later complaining of obstruction on what side of her nose? The right side where everything's open, or the left side where she's got a nice bulky chirp? Put up your hands for the right side. Put up your hands for the left side. Why would you think the right side? Fair enough. So in this case, it's actually different. She can't feel airflow back to her nose on that right side. So airflow is both physical, but also central. And that's why if you have my grand's horseradish, which she was always convinced she was better than me at ENT, because it will really make you feel like you breathe better through your nose. If we give you menthol or eucalyptus, if you're in cold air environments, that makes you breathe better through your nose. And it's a purely subjective feeling. Okay? And if you don't have space, you'll never breathe better. But if you do have some space, we can vary that through sensory changes. What we're really talking about today is pediatrics, kids. And with a pediatric nasal obstruction, what we really mean is a chronic mouth breather. Okay, just a, a kid who doesn't breathe. And there are lots of reasons why kids may be uh, born with a block nose. The kind of treatment we already talked about. And there's a whole uh, a, a group of different types of congenital, central uh, conditions such as uh, dermoid cysts, cryomas, a group of aperture stenosis, and genetic causes that can actually cause it. There's also a whole variety of acquired reasons why a kid may present with a nasal obstruction. And it's not really trying to teach you all the different or the differential of a block nose. What we want to try and concentrate on is this. 
God is this kid turning to this this teenager, I should say. Okay, can you see that? Blocked snotty child turning to a typical Alan Wake process, which is what they do. So we, and I followed this from a dentist, Dr. William Hong online, and it basically shows, and you guys know this, that our facial growth occurs in two different groups, five to 10, and then age 12 to 15. And that's a major facial development. Now, face grows in three different aspects. You know, you've got your, your maxilla, which is your, 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 sorry, your three base tongue. You've got your central portion, which is called the maxilla, which uses the tongue and nasal airflow to expand. So we think having your mouth closed and breathing air through the nose allows the tongue to push the palate across. And that's why there may be other reasons, like tongue tie, that can contribute to uh, the palate not expanding appropriately as well. Now, we do know that um, at birth, your head's big. That's why kids look like little dolls, you know, these big, bulky heads. And by age nine, it's already 95% of, the, of the, uh, the full size. So the, most of our head expansion occurs during these formative years with blocked nose. It's only around about age 12 that orthodontists start the treatment, and I'm assuming for a variety of reasons, one of which must be because of this, this is the one aid where you can manipulate the face. However, I've been overwhelmed over the years working with a number of orthodontists who've actually shown me how they can re-manipulate adult faces. It's quite amazing how dentists, uh, so orthodontists at braces can actually change the structure and shape of adult faces. And how over the years I've been referred to a lot of blocked nose adults, and I'm blocking their nose to get if orthodontists can actually change their, their, their face as well. So what happens if you don't unblock the nose? Well, we know that there's craniofacial consequences. And the then next answer is, well, so what? Well, we know that a, the changes seen in this can also lead to sleep disorder breathing, which is probably one of the more common reasons for failed sleep apnea treatments. Now, the most common mechanism of allergic sleep disorder breathing also is chronic nasal obstruction. So we're dealing with the craniofacial consequences of a chronic blocked nose, we come and see poor outcomes, not only from our sleep apnea surgery, but also from our management of allergy itself. Now, what's the data behind this? And the data is not fantastic as with everything. There are two very good dental studies, two retrospective reviews, one looking at six to 12 year old kids, and others 10 to 14, where they simply compared a group of kids who are either persistent mouth breathers or nasal breathers. And then they looked at a whole variety of different uh, angles, trying to, uh, um, assess what would happen in the mouth breathers as opposed to the nose breathers. And what they showed, that people with mouth breathers have changes in the horizontal, vertical, and lateral planes. So in the horizontal plane, they basically found that they had these higher arch palates, you know? Vertically, they, they, their anterior facial ratios will change, and then uh, their, their lower dimensions will also change as well. And this is all thought to be a consequence of persistent nasal breathing. So, they demonstrated in a retrospective you know, case series comparing two groups that the nose breathers did a lot better, or the mouth breathers, I should say, um, had a lot more craniofacial changes. And that's really just summarizing it. Now, this whole concept of facial change has actually been known by EETs, independent of the dentist, for years. In fact, the term analoid facies was described by Mayer in 1868. So, a fair word, a bit of a he basically described that kids with very big adenoids got this long face syndrome. So what's a long face syndrome? You basically got this longer, narrower face. You tend to have this open mouth, slightly projected, narrow nares, and forward posture. This kind of a thing. And it's a thing that is so obvious, and I always joke, I can walk around with my car at Westford Bonner Junction and say, you need my help, and you need my help, and so on. So it is quite an obvious thing. And this was shown to be a consequence of chronic nasal obstruction, at that time thought to be because of the adenoids. Now even better studies were done, again, pre-ethics, pre-animal ethics, I could say, on uh, um, a chimpanzees, for recent stuff, exactly. And what they did is they took these newborn mon the monkeys and they plugged their nose. And they said, let's see what happens. And what they showed is that these monkeys had the exact same oropharyngeal and postural changes seen in their nose. So in six months of blocking the monkey's nose, they saw high arch palate, forward posture, and, and they actually showed literal uh, um, changes in the musculature. 
And then even more impressively, they unblocked the nose. And half of the rhesus monkeys and said, let's see what happens here. And they actually demonstrated in a developing rhesus monkey who's re-established hair flow that these changes were correct. In other words, the, the monkeys would actually change the structural changes by simply breathing better through their nose. Now we know that a blocked nose is not the only reason we see high arch palates. We've already mentioned tongue tie. But this is quite a common thing seen in some uh, Elos Danlos syndrome, which is a cartilage disorder, neuromuscular disorders, and prematurity itself. The thing about it is if you look at this group of kids, almost a uh, well, high proportion of them go on to have sleep disordered breathing. So it all sits and fits quite nicely. You know, if we leave a child with a blocked nose, they develop these changes. We've got an animal monkey and at least case series that show it. Okay? These changes, whether they're seen because of the blocked nose or for other reasons, are often associated with why we are failing in ENT, in sleep, in, in, in sleep uh, surgery, sleep apnea surgery, and allergy surgery. So when we're trying to cure a child's sleep apnea, we essentially do an adenotom selectomy. And we always, always tell people we do a fantastic job. If you look at the meta-analysis, the cure rate's actually not at that good. And if you look at a long period of time, over cohort, it's quite a high deterioration rate. I'm definitely seeing that in my practice now that I'm converging onto 12 years in practice, where kids who we operate on when they're three and four presenting to me now, rock nose, congestion, very happy that they stopped snoring. But when you take a history from them, they're still mouth breathers, they're still unsettled. Sometimes they've started to snore again, and therefore they're coming back to see us. And in a big uh, Taiwanese study, they showed that the earlier you intervene, the less likely there is to recurrence. Okay, future for four. Another large longitudinal study of you know, 12,500 kids showed that adenoidectomy had a better long-term success than adenotonsillectomy. And again, just looking at the, the discussion, they thought it was because the adenoidectomy was performed earlier. So again, this is conjecture, it's not good research, but it does suggest that early intervention in children and re-establishing airflow may be a reason why we see better improvement down the line. Now, Gillamot and Sullivan were a fantastic uh, 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 um, pediatric sleep physicians. They work out of Stanford, and they're actually the guys who taught us about sleep apnea. They're the first guys to describe pediatric sleep apnea. And they've really changed and saying, look, sleep apnea is important. We've got to do adenotonsillectomy. We've had our first randomized controlled trial coming out of the States now to prove adenotonsillectomy works for sleep apnea. They're now going the next step and they're saying we also got to think about nasal obstruction and facial growth. What about allergic rhinitis? Common problem, 12.5% of kids, 25% of adults. Most common problem for any allergy patients, including anybody here in the room, is a blocked nose. And it's the blocked nose that is usually leads to the poor sleep. So very few people will say, you know, I wake up in the middle of the night with an itchy nose, but I can breathe beautifully. And when we resolve nasal obstruction purely for allergy patients, although the allergies persist unchecked, you know, an operation never fixes an allergy, they very rarely really continue to complain of nasal obstruction or sleep disorders. So the next question is, if we agree that it's a blocked nose that's causing the problem, the next question to answer is, well, where is the blockage? So these are adenoids. Adenoids like tonsil tissue. Okay, so you have our palatine tonsil and adenoid at the back of the nose. Do you all know what your adenoids do? Or your tonsils do? Let's put it this way. Who believes in evolution? If you believe in evolution, the adenoids are part of your lymph tissue. That means they're catch bugs that present into your body. We've evolved beyond them. We don't really need them anymore. Okay? So we actually have lymph tissue throughout our upper airway, multi associated well, mucosa associated lymph tissue, gut associated lymph tissue, and a very complex innate immune system which allows us to catch it. So we don't really need if you're creationists, you believe in God, you know, not. Okay, God. Okay. Then you believe that He loves ENT surgeons, and adenoid and tonsils were given to us as a gift so we could pay school fees. <laughs> <laughs> this is a big adenoid, and uh, you can see there's a very small airway there, and we can remove that. So we can significantly improve uh, the airway itself. And huge adenoids, I would have thought were common. But about eight years ago, I was giving a talk, and I was looking for these bloods at core temperature, 36 and a half. And what's the role of our nose? Anybody know the role of the nose? Yeah. Warm, humidify the air, brilliant, why? Extract oxygen, exactly. So if you will take a big breath into your nose, 
I cannot take a big breath into your mouth. Which feels better? But do you know you've taken a third of the volume? For turbulence. However, the septum, that's a very deviated nasal septum post trauma in a child, and the middle turbulence, which is the next set of turbulence, can all contribute um, for nasal obstruction. And some people are lucky. Big turbulence, big adenoids, and big middle turbulence. So often there's complex, something that multiple, and this is a 15 year old. Now, the turbulence is really the area we'll be focusing on most of And this is really new. This is only a few surgeons in the last 10 years, and maybe more recently, uh, an increasing number of surgeons are starting to realize you can do something with fun. And that's because of the technology and our, our operative skill ability to actually do something. So we ignored it because we couldn't do anything about it. Isn't that life? So I always joke with my colleagues, man's best friend is a dog, but the ENT's best friend is the turbulent. There's lots of reasons for that. Essentially, for us, if we do a bad septal surgery, but good turbulent surgery, we'll get away with it. Internal valve is one of the toughest part of us to breathe. If you'll notice, the very first part of your nose, the very inking of the part that collapses is called your internal valve. And that is the turbulent plate forms part of it. Your nose, uh, um, your turbulence actually interfere with the eustachian tube. And we were talking about that earlier, about eustachian tube and its effect on tinnitus, eustachian tube and the effect on hearing loss or fullness. So we know that if we can improve the turbulent, we can improve the station tube. Addressing the turbulent gives us what we call allergy holidays. What does that mean? Well, we can't cure allergy by operating, but because allergy is mediated through uh, uh, parasympathetic fibers, you need to feel with those by addressing the turbulent, you can get an improvement. Plus, the most important reason we address the turbulence is for access, ability to deliver medicine, ability to put cameras in the nose, ability to clean things, and obviously to monitor and watch if there are any problems. How do we manage the turbulence? Well, the easiest way is with topical steroids. Okay, and there's very good evidence to show us that using topical steroids is working. The most important thing to remember if you really do analyze the data, and we have done a systematic review looking at this, is to know the dose and the volume. Okay, what does that mean? You don't want to give small amounts, you want to give large amounts. Now, Nasonex, uh, which is mometazone, is now available over the counter. Speech therapists, dentists, who, if you want to have it prescribed, can recommend Nasonex, wonderful medicine, and know that it's completely safe, okay? We can go through that if you want. The systemic absorption is minuscule, 1%. Uh, we've done a systematic review showing that it doesn't affect eyes or glaucoma. If the whole theory of steroids um, causing atrophy is true of steroids on the skin, but in the nose, five years, continuous um, use of topical steroids shows that it improves nasal health. So Nasonex is probably the safest thing you guys can prescribe. Not only that, it's the most effective. And it's going to work, it's going to work in many of your kids, and you can recommend it to parents, especially, you know, the, the, again, the Nasonex, because it's just over the counter and very effective. The problem often is how do we deliver it? Now, there are better medicines like Flixinase, which are steroid drops, that allows us to get a much bigger volume and dose into the nose. If you aren't able to prescribe it, then just using more Nasonex. So two sprays of nasonex twice a day is quite okay. Parents always get a bit anxious. The amount we actually give is minuscule. So I've been on nasonex for 38 years. Amazed, I know, because I don't look 38. But, um, I mean, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it's completely safe, and it's the first line. The problem, however, with it is that it doesn't always work. And it doesn't always work not because the drug itself isn't good, but because it's often we're unable to get it into the nose. And because of structure and the delivery, 
you're unable to get a good result. So if not working doesn't mean it's a bad drug or the wrong drug, it just means it may not be getting to where we want to go. And that's really where surgery comes into it. Now surgery and kids have been done for years, various different techniques, I won't bore you with it. But the powered inferior terminoplasty technique was described by a colleague of mine, PJ Walmart, an ex-South African from, uh, from Adelaide, a really top rhinologist. And, uh, and he basically brought a technique which is starting to take over all the other techniques. And I'm sure it's the same in all of your profession. There's something that doesn't really work and there's multiple different ways of doing it, correct? Everybody has their favorite way of doing it. But when suddenly something is that much better than everything else, it becomes universal adoption. So lots and lots of people start doing it. This would be the technique you'd find more than 80% of all rhinologists, sinus specialists, are actually adopting now. Um, uh, Ray Saxo, who's a colleague of mine at Concord in our research group, did an excellent randomized controlled trial. This is a blinded, a blinded randomized controlled trial where they looked at the three commonest technique, electrocautery, which is submucosal, submucosal resection, which is the commonest technique that used to be performed in a form of terminoplasty. And what they showed is, at one year, you know, reasonably good results, but at five years, in a subject of how many people felt better, you could see that terminal plasty had outstanding outcomes. And that's what you want. You can't do an operation and one year later, when a third of patients actually think they're any better. And then similarly for an objective outcome, it was even better. So you can see a lot of people, you could see down their nose, but they don't necessarily felt any better. And we can explain that later. And in the terminal plasty, you could always see down the nose, and almost all of them also felt better. The big question we had was, is that safe enough to do in children? And it was a bit controversial because one of the complications of a terminoplasty is a bleed. And that could be quite a big uh, deal and hard to control. So myself and Ray Sachs looked at a series of 410 patients between the two of us um, and demonstrated its safety with no primary or secondary bleeds in any of these kids. I now have a series of over 600 and we've ever only had one bleed uh, at three weeks, 14 was uh, um, uh, easily controlled. And the key to this, and I won't gross too many people out, is that with the technology we have today, with the better cameras and systems, we can reshape this entire turbinate. So this is the side of the turbinate in a six-year-old child. The patient's obviously asleep, and what I'm doing is I'm actually removing... Um, oh sorry, I was removing the, 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 the lower part, we lift up the lining, we take the bone out now, and it's the bone that makes the, the world of difference. We find the artery divided, and that's what we call the good night division because we usually sleep well, and then we monitor and watch that. Um, techniques is important, and different people are different. And we know when we get the luxury cobine scans, which we usually get whenever we get a referral from a dentist, which is absolutely wonderful, you can have a good look at the shape of the, the terminal. Over here, you see a person with very thin bone, thick mucosa. And these patients, in my experience, do very well with medicine. And when we analyze our own data in our review, we found that almost everybody we operate on had thick bone, assuming that we're not operating the patients who basically respond well to medicine. As opposed to a patient like this, where there's very thick bone, thin mucosa. And this is a patient who obviously doesn't respond well to medicine. This was the patient who's having contraculosis. So what are we trying to do? We're taking this 10-year-old kid who's been on topical steroids, high dose, flexinase for six weeks, and present with a nose like this. Where's the root? And that's the same patient after an operation. So we can open up the airway. So we're addressing both the front of the nose and the back of the nose to finally restore airflow appropriately in these children. So you've always got to ask yourself if you introduce a new technique, is it enough? You know, first we have to ask yourself, is it safe? That's the first stage of research. The second stage of research is, oh yeah, you're doing a good job. And I think that's where a lot of people Forget, you know, you, you kind of do something, you realize it's quite safe, and you've been doing it for years, you go, anecdotally it works. Therefore, I'm just going to stick with it. And that's not fair. We often realize that we make lots of mistakes. And I've been, you know, at international conferences where somebody said, oh, I've done this 600 times. And I said, well, there's nothing wrong with doing something 600 times bad. You know, it doesn't mean you've done it 600 times, when you always get a good result. You've got to show <coughs> objective outcomes. So we said, well, let's define what is medical and surgical success. So we said, Success would be stop the breathing, stop the mouth breathing, stop the snoring, and control the allergic rhinitis. And we thought, well, this isn't an operation for allergy, but it should do very well on the top two. And we did a six week review, so we took all of our patients, consecutive patients, monitored them, and look, suddenly we saw mouth breathing wasn't so great, snoring wasn't so great, but they're all telling us how wonderful the allergy is. So the allergy we worked out was this allergy holiday, which I've already alluded to. 
lift up the lining, which fuels the parasympathetic nerves, and they don't have those allergy symptoms. And that can last days, weeks, and in some patients forever. But most of the time, it's temporary. But what about the, the, the mouth breathing and the snoring? Why weren't we getting any better? So that's when I took out to other colleagues that introduced me to the concept of nasal neglect. So that's a snotty nose. Okay? Now, what this basically is, is somebody who's not using their nose. And no one in this room will let their nose get by this. If you enjoy good airflow, the only reason you let it go like this is if you've just given up on your nose and you mouth breathing, you bypass your mouth, and then you get all this terrible crust there. So if you clean up the crust, patients will get better airway. If you surgically address the nose, it's even better. But what we'll find is when we looked at these kids at six weeks, a lot of them looked like this. This is Booger City. It's a really well-shaped terminal, beautiful airway, but look at all this mucus. You know, this is six weeks, this is, it becomes only operation, this is, you know, almost here, maybe a little bit of operative crusting. Okay, can look at this side. You know, big, thick mucus discharge, but look how wonderful the airway is. There's this massive gap, yeah, and put a camera cap cap into his nose. So what we realize is that simply reshaping his airway, and a kid who hasn't breathed through his airway in maybe four or five years, it wasn't enough. We're going to teach him good nasal hygiene, and we're going to retrain them, we're going to teach him how to breathe through their nose. What we started doing is looking at educating them, showing kids how to blow their nose, which is usually easy. You put a mirror under their nose, get them to breathe in and out until they see the mist. And I always say, look, it's like a dragon. Or the older kids, you say, if you blow more mist than me, I'll give you a lolly. Bravo, you always win. <coughs> we put a tongue depressor between their nose and get them to watch TV. Best thing in the world. As soon as your mouth opens, TV goes off. If mum is strict with them, unfortunately, some of the mothers aren't. Okay? Then the kid will sit with their mouth closed simply to watch TV and show them some of the kids are so blocked and they try to do this, they're like, might say they're like almost like a glue. <laughs> Just to watch a bit more TV or play computers or work on their, their iPads, but get them continuously breathing through their nose. Get them to blow a bubbles in a straw. They keep blowing, breathing through the nose, out through the straw. Misty mirrors is what we discussed. Get them running on the spot, mouth closed. If you do it longer, competition between siblings always works well. Nasal washes and rinses, very important. So all of our kids get a rinse introduced after their operation. They get an adult wash, proper rinse. They get shown how to do it. They get given their own bottle as soon as they leave the hospital. And then we get them to start the rinses as often as possible. And you've got to keep reminding them. So you've got to keep reminding the parents. And every time I give them a form, they say, oh, you gave me one of these last time. I say, well, do you use it? No. I say, well, great. Take another one. Um, and then we get the parents to monitor their sleep. So I keep telling the parents, I'm trying to make sure your child is sleeping better. Sleeping with their mouth closed. Monitoring. And kids could be sneaky. They could sit like this. They don't have to open their mouth up wide. So we get the parents to go, watch them, and even put a mirror in front of their mouth to see if they're breathing through their nose or their mouth. If that doesn't work, then there's a role of oral myologists. There's uh, uh, nose rebreathing, you know, the simple instructions which I give, breathing techniques they had um, a significant improvement in sleep apnea outcomes. So chronic mouth breathing can lead to uh, um, structural sleep disorder breathing. I recommend early intervention. Uh, once you've intervened, you want to, uh, inter you want to uh, uh, retrain the post. How a terminal fasting technique we believe really works and further research is required. Now this is an oldish talk because we're actually very far into this study. So we're doing a prospective pediatric uh, uh, study. Um, it's not randomized controlled. It's all children uh, who come to me who failed at least six weeks of medical management who then go on to have a turbulent surgery. Um, they do uh, a sleep questionnaire, a nose questionnaire, visual analog scores, have a nasal inspiratory peak flow, and then we monitor them pre-op, six weeks, six months, one year. So we're gonna collect as many as we can. We've, we've probably got about 40 kids already, but at various stages of the, the, the follow-up. We're also getting a whole group of people who wanted the operation, filled in the first form, and then we'd lose them to follow up. They didn't want the operation, and we're going to use that as a, as a comparative uh, uh, group to see how did they do. Because maybe a year later, they're all fantastic, and we're kidding ourselves about this. But the preliminary data in this has been really phenomenal, mostly in sleep improvements. You know, how much better does my kid sleep? And it's not do I snore or not. It, you know, does my kid, is they unsettled, are they restless, you know, wake up, are there cognitive issues during the course of the day, are there concentration issues, is somebody fed their concentration issues, you know, that they're worried about. So we really see big improvements in that. 
But again, uh, I've been humbled in many times before with research where the outcome is not what you thought it was going to be. We currently got a whole group of, of uh, students looking at the bone thickness to try and correlate uh, uh, whether surgery is, um, with medical failure, is correlated with bone thickness. And uh, this has always been on the cards, but it's been a hard one to actually get moving, which is to look at nose breathing exercises and sharing exercises. Because I'm a big believer in nose breathing exercises, uh, but some of my colleagues in my research group don't. They think just engaging the parents is what's working. Might be true. So we'd like to put this together, but these two are very far advanced as research. This one, we really, it's nothing more than protocol at the moment. What, what Of the percentage of yeah. yeah, it's very variable. So to be honest, I've never looked at the data itself. I see a lot of patients. I probably only operate on about twenty to thirty percent of them. Right. Uh, but that's for various reasons. Some might not want to come back to see you. Um, some have other issues. You know, so it's hard to say how many fail medical management. But every patient in my practice gets medical management, and I can tell you now, a lot of them, the majority of them, do that. You know, and I often get referrals from from dentists, which I really appreciate and love. But what I'd like to tell all the dentists is start from a medical management plan first, because that's all I'll ever do. You know, it's when they fail medical management, when you try this topical steroids, you've, you've given them breathing those breathing exercise, and it's quite clear that they're not working. Or in the older children who have high arch palate, all the teeth, and they're staining the front of their teeth, when it's just dead obvious there's something wrong here. Those are the patients who, who have a much bigger hit rate, but who, who get much better success. But yeah, the majority are medically managed. Not surgical drugs. Mm -hmm. I know it makes it look like you just operate on everyone. No, 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 not true. Yeah. So six, six weeks is a relatively short period. Um, not just from a medical drop. management plan. Mm -hmm. yeah, you can see it. Improve. The problem what happens to us is that we we start them a high dose steroid drop like a flexinate. They come back six weeks later. They've done their exercise, fused their drops, and they're much better. Yeah. And then they stop everything. Yeah. And you know, two years later we come back with a kid with obvious. Consequences. You said, "Oh, well, it didn't work. Did you use a drop?" Oh no, I forgot to. Mm -hmm. So we write a plan for them, and we write it back to the GP or the dentist, and say, "If the problem persists, these are things to do." And we try to remind them because medicines do work. And remember, if you're very allergic, you need to use medicines anyway. So we actually do allergy testing as part of our medical plan. The non-allergic patients are more likely who have as obstruction will often end up with an operation because operation is going to fix you. The allergic kids, I always remind the parents, you're going to need medicines anyway. So medicines are working now, you know, wait. You know, see what the future holds. Any other questions? So we do have, I don't know if uh, Eric's around, um, talks just on the dental side of things. So do we have a lot of dentists in the room or? Yep. Okay. Well, if you're happy for you guys, we can. Up through if you just the ENT dental side of things. So we always, you know, we always say that uh, that um, you know we work collaboratively. You know, physicians and surgeons, or dentists and surgeons, or, or uh, uh, physicians and surgeons. So they always say that when a surgeon looks in the mirror, that's what he sees. And when a physician looks at a doctor, a surgeon, that's kind of what they see. Mm. But really, this is what it's all about. It's about harmony. Uh, for no time implying that the, that that's the position. Um, and it really is wonderful because, again, working together with oral myologists has taught me a fortune. Working with dentists has taught me a fortune. My, my knowledge these days of, of just basic rudimental orthodontics and dentistry has really improved. But it's really understanding how everything works is because for years I've had a chance of working together with maxillofacial surgeons. It started with the fact that they kept from picking up sinus uh, pathology and they're referring it to me, and then if we do the combined cases, we do it together, and then I'll be doing something about that and you'll want to do it our way, you know? Even things like some of the uh, uh, um, hemostatic material I use in the nose, I learned from my dental friend. So, how does dentistry and, and sinus surgery overlap? I'll just quickly go through this with you guys. The first one is that in my world, I'm always looking for recalcitrant sinus disease. The sinus situs is more complex than people think. It's a very broad topic. It's got multiple different types of sinusitis, and there's a group of what are called recalcitrant patients who just don't respond to surgery or medicine. And one of the reasons why is often underlying dental or dentogenic disease. So here you've got a patient who had very limited previous surgery, came to see me saying, you know, sinus is terrible, I'm not happy with the last surgeon, 
you know, it's all going well. Now, he didn't have great surgery, but nobody gave a comment on the fact that, oh, this periodic abscess is around his teeth. Sent to the dentist, sorted out the teeth, sinusitis went away. Sometimes it's a little bit more uh, serious than that. So this is a dentigerous cyst. That's a, a free-floating tooth. So sometimes dental pathology will affect the nose directly. So obviously we can work hand in hand with a maxillofacial surgeon, and this can all be done through the nose. So this is the patient's tooth, which I extracted through the nose. I love telling my dental colleagues that I could pull teeth through the nose. <laughs> Not all the time, <laughs> but, but it works quite well. There was a, a systematic review to done out of the Italian group and looked at the different types of, of cysts, the radicular, the, the dentigerous, or the carato uh, uh, cysts of a bunch of uh, uh, tumors now, which they call them. Um, and they looked at the different techniques, and probably the best technique is actually an endonasal medial maxillectomy prior to dealing with the, oral, the open component. What else can happen? Well, a dental infection can cause not just a, a inflammatory changes, but can cause quite significant osteitis or changes in the nose. This is a patient with periodontal abscess with significant chronic maxillary sinusitis. And here's another example of dental pathology causing significant protracted maxillary sinusitis. I assume this would be unilateral? Uh, not always. Okay. Uh, yes, most commonly unilateral. So a unilateral pathology in ENT is always a tumor to the otherwise and most commonly dental, as kind of a pre-teacher of the registrar. Um, most important thing with odontogenic disease is please let the ENTs go first. And sometimes the dentist says, well, I couldn't get hold of an ENT, or it takes you, you know, my patient in front of the ENT said three months, wait before I could even see them, then form an association with an ENT, and in the dentist will contact me and say, look, we've got a patient, you know, it's got a periapolapse, needs a tooth pull, needs an implant, you know, we will prioritize the patient straight away to deal with it. Because if you don't, so this is just an example, sorry, of a patient with um, persistent sinusitis, second to dental infection, and this is the same patient after we've done a medium axillectomy approach. So you can see how much access we can get inside the nose to deal with it. The problem, however, and we'll go through it in a second, is that sometimes it's dental pathology, but sometimes it's iatrogenic. So here's an implant that's gone into the sinus and has triggered the sinusitis. Here's an implant and a sinus lift, similar consequence, um, and here's just a sinus lift. And what this is is where the dentist goes in and to thicken up the bone, they lift up the flap of the mucosa, they put the hypoxiapatite type layer to thicken that bone, and that's fine, but if the underlying sinus has either pre-existing sinus disease or very narrow maxillary outflow tract, it can trigger a sinusitis. And that can infect the, the, the implant, or it should just ruin the whole thing as well. So at least once a year, I get the opportunity of removing an implant to get it from my exilofacial colleagues because of an unchecked sinusitis. So we always say that the most important thing in these cases is quick access to an ENT. We often give a medical management first, as with everything, we're going to rush an operation. So I'd usually give a prednisone if there's no complication, augment it, but we swab the nose to see if there's something else. Hydroscopic steroid drops, and sometimes we'll do in office treatments. Um, this is a patient with sinusitis who couldn't have an operation, so that's a, a dissolvable foam with um, steroid and antibiotic on it. And we can um, open up the maxillary sinus and now drain a little bit better with in office treatments. That's applying um, a steroid antibody cream directly into the sinus in the rooms. And that's a picture of the same patient six weeks later with resolved sinusitis. Um, so why do we worry about letting the dentist go first? Or antral fistula. And we see more and more of these all the time. Um, so this is a patient with a partially obstructed outflow tract, sinus disease, the tooth is pulled, and now there's this big hole. In other words, the sinus is communicating with the oral cavity, which is rather gross if the sinus is dripping down into the mouth. You can see this patient actually had a mastectomy on the other side, which is a sign of, of us what we call mucostasis, non-functional sinus disease. Uh, this is another patient who had an oroantral fistula closure, which failed. Sinuses had been addressed previously, but not well, and it had scarred up completely. And this is the same patient after what we call a medium axillectomy approach, where we've opened that up really well, and the oroantral fistula healed spontaneously. We didn't have to do another closure. 
we can actually do an oral fistula closer through the nose. I still always work in conjunction with the maxillary facial surgeons, but we can now raise the flap, and depending on the pneumatization of the maxillary sinus, I can rotate the flap in the nose into the oral fistula from above. So we take away the pressure, we, 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 we uh, um, correct the bone, we fill it with a bone graft, and we rotate the flap over it, and we've got quite a good success rate with that. So it depends on the pneumatization of the maxillary sinus, whether we do it all through the nose, no, or do we need a combination. Yeah, how do you close the sinus down? There's a minimal Sorry? bone. There's a minimal bone remaining on the floor of the sinus. How yep. do you know we close the The minimal bone that's holding the sinus. So, so we don't have to close the sinus. Sinus semicosis is drained. We take away the bone. No, we the How do you close it? Back? How do you close it? Yeah. Take away the underlying pressure, clean out the sinus, and just rotate it flat over the top. You get a bone falling afterwards? Or? Very rarely, no. So bone usually comes if you strip your cones from bone itself. Uh, but if it's thin bone, so like we do a lot of sinus surgery, we remove bone all the time. Um, the, the, the sinus itself is actually, the mucosal integrity is actually pretty good. So I'll take bone away so that there's nothing but size mucosal brain right behind it. Um, and we're quite comfortably happy. So we definitely don't worry around teeth and, uh, and changes. And the problem that's driving the oriental fistula is the sinus. It's blocked, it's obstructed, it's a high pressure system going down. If you clear the sinus, rotate the flap, and it persists, then you've got to look for a tumor. You've got to look for, obviously, sometimes you can get the mutualization or, or sclerosis formation in the tract itself or other pathology. And it's quite real. Um, <coughs> so, the meter back to where I go through it. Um, Prelacrimal approach is another way we can get into a sinus without having to do these big openings. And sometimes we get these very anterior uh, odontogenic cysts, and we can actually make a cut right at the front of the nose push the front wall of the nose to the side, come in, remove it, and then close it off as well. Um, we do, again, this is not so much for you guys, but for me, we show this to a lot of our colleagues. Sometimes sinus surgery isn't always well done. It is a subspecialty now. This is a colleague of mine who was trying to get, uh, a, a, first he opened up the sinus beautifully, but completely missed the cyst. And you can see the same patient when we've opened the cyst properly, how the cyst is low down, as opposed to this guy where he left, left the cyst in place. Um, some of our colleagues, again, have attempts to open up the sinus that will scar down, and that's always worrying because the, the, the dentist goes ahead thinking that the sinus is safe, but in the scarred up state, sinus is as bad as the blocked sinus. And again, the same patient where we've now opened up the sinus more aggressively. So the last thing I'll quickly run through for you guys is well, what is normal? Because you guys look at CT scans all the time. So this is a healthy sinus. We've cut this person in half. This is the right eye, this is the left eye. This is the nose. We already talked about it, turbinate, inferior and middle turbinate. And you can see how the sinus makes this liter and a half of mucus a day. If your nose is ever running and it doesn't stop, and you've wondered why, it's because it does. It makes a liter and a half of mucus a day. It runs all the way up to the top there, and then dribbles over these turbinates. Why? It's mucus over a warm turbinate. And that's how we warm and humidify the air. Uh, and that's the same example on this side, except it's a little bit more bulked, those little turbulent. What often we don't just worry about is this, little changes on the floor. And those are called retention cysts. And about 80% of patients will have some kind of mucosal changes on the floor of the sinus. And whether it's correlated or not to the tooth, it doesn't actually matter. That is not a problem, even to do a sinus leak. Okay, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's blocked ducts, it's, it's, it's dependent muc you know, mucus sometimes. But if it's along just the floor, we don't worry about it. Sometimes it's pretty obvious. I think all of you in the audience, even those who aren't on this sort of dentists or doctors, would admit this person must have a problem. So this is somebody with polyps and it's expanding her eyes because the polyps are so big. This person's got polyps with thickening of the bone, so sometimes it's quite obvious. But what about a patient like this? Like, would ever, anybody think there's actually a problem here? And the reality is there is, because we talked about the, the sinus should go from white bone to black hair. So on this side, you could see it's reasonably healthy, but there is mucosal thickening in the outer tracks. Can you see that? So we don't worry about polyps on the bottom or changes on the bottom, but we do worry when there are inflammatory changes circumferentially. That means there probably is an outflow tract, and I would at least would medically manage this person before implementing a dental treatment. Often there's structural problems, so that's called a contrabilosa, that's when there's an air cell in the middle terminal. 
that's called an infraorbital ethmoid cell. So the outflow track wasn't next to the eye, but pushed medially. That person has both contra and an infraorbital ethmoid cell. Some people can have large posterior ethmoid cells. That's a condition called a silent sinus syndrome. And that's called hyperneumatized Missouri sinus. So there are finesse things that sometimes need another eye. And if you're not sure, I'm always happy to look at a CT scan for you because what's happened to me, I'm just giving the login details. Everything's online, or most things online these days. Um, and I love looking at them, just giving you feedback. Because you don't even need a clinical picture for the patient. You can tell safe or not safe on the CT scan, or warrant, uh, uh, at least the history of life, warrant the history. Next question I often get is, is the sinus open? And the problem is that if this sinus, which has got what's had a posterior and possibly a previous surgeon has made an opening, they actually haven't opened the natural opening. The problem with this person is that although if you initially this sinus disease is called a sinus, it's draining, the patient will have persistent problem and is still at risk of a of an oral fistula. So sometimes just having a slight opening isn't enough. So this patient was going to have this extracted and a, an implant. <laughs> input yet, I, well, I did go on to actually surgically address this patient's uh, sinuses problem. So we did talk at the beginning that if you're going to take a history from a patient, it can be misleading. Although we don't trust our patients, but you know, sometimes if they think it's the right, it might be better. But it's still always worth asking every one of your patients, whether you're a speech therapist, a dentist, um, you know, tell me about your nose. Do you mouth breathe? Do you get a fluctuating nasal structure? How many here is aware that their nose blocks on one side and then the other side? Anybody aware of that in their nose? So that's actually normal physiology. Your nose cycles from one side to the other. One side swells and the other side uh, gets smaller and does that all the time. It's happening to all of us. Okay, every one to eight hours your nose uh, rotates. But if you become aware of it, it usually means there's extra uh, congestion. Does your nose block only when you lie down? Sometimes you lie on one side, I'm sure you've had this when you've got a cold, and your nose, the lower side is blocked, and you turn over to the other side, and the other side blocks. And it isn't that fluid is going from one side of your nose to the other, it's just that the dependent side swells more. It's dependent, it's got blood in it. And then do you respond to decongestion? So the patient says, oh my God, I love Otrum, and I love Fixie, and I, I can't live without it. That's actually a problem, because those decongestants are, are fantastic and give you instant improvement, but when you use them, they get a rebound, and then people get addicted to them. So I have a big series of patients with a condition called rhinitis medicamentosa, which is addiction to decongestants. And that causes everything from septal perforation, holes in their septum, to chronic sensory perception issues, where the patient just can't feel their nose. So we talked right at the bottom, at the beginning, about the lady who couldn't feel her nose. And that happens in some patients where they have no ability to feel their nose, and therefore they complain they can't breathe, even if they've got an adequate airway. And you'll probably hear a lot of press about a condition called empty nose syndrome. Now, empty nose syndrome is actually a psychological disorder, it's not a nasal problem, but it's people who lack perception of the airflow in their nose, and therefore they feel that they can't breathe. Breathing through your nose is a luxury. And when you can't do it, and I don't want to wish a cold in any of you, but when you do get a cold, you probably know how bad it is, it really impacts quality of life. And it actually sends some people crazy. So simple things. Is your nose blocked? And I'll ask this to you. Browse, breathe. You feel that it fluctuates because that's a sign that it's a bit congested. Does it block when you lie flat? And do you find your congestion is fantastic? You get discharged out the front, out the back. What's your sense of smell like? Do you ever get pressure? Never ask about pain. What's the commonest cause of facial pain? Myofascial headaches. Okay, 90% of patients I see with sinus headaches do not have sinus sinus. They have facial pain. Myofascial pain, tension headaches, commonest cause. And that's why there are chiropractors out there who claim that they cure sinusitis. They don't. They're very good at curing myofascial headaches. Um, and how often do you get a cold is a really good question to ask patients. Cold in kids, four to five times a year. Adults, two to three times a year. But it should always be less than a week. So my kid gets sick, goes to daycare five times a year. Oh, that means they're getting sick almost every six weeks. But if they get sick and a week later they're fine, no problem. If your kid gets sick and a month later they still got the snotty nose, the daycare always asks you why they're sick and they're they're fine, they're fine, that's just them, that's a problem. Same with adults. If adults get cold and you've been within a week, not a problem. But if they're getting cold three, four times a year 
and it lasts you more than a week, it's probably sinusoidal. And just remember the frog in the pot, which is most of us don't know any better. And if you put a frog in a pot and you turn the temperature up very slowly, the frog sits there until it boils to death. If you took a frog and threw it into a boiling pot, it would always jump out. What does that mean? Most people don't even know they have a problem. And I learned this thanks to dentists. Because I used to get patients said to me, the dentist, I want to implant this when the patient has polyps. And I was always going to say, go ahead with an implant with this polyps in the sinus. And I said to the patient, what's wrong with you? And we do it. It's called a sinonasal outcome test, SNOT 22, appropriately named. So it's a, it's a validation test. And this guy had circled zero for everything. Nothing's wrong with me. I said, how's your airflow? Excellent. Smell great. Do you get discharged? No. Does your nose block? Never. And I said, look, we can't operate to do implants. You've got polyps. I showed him the polyps. I showed him the discharge. He wasn't interested. We're going to medically manage you. So I gave him prednisone. We gave him antibiotics. We gave him washers and steroids. He came back. Oh, maybe, maybe a little bit better, but not quite. So that's what we need to operate. So we operated on him. And he came back to say his life's never been better. Okay, he's breathing better. He can smell. He doesn't have headaches. And I was like, wait a second. He told me he never had any of those things anyway. But he didn't realize for all of his life that was normal. And now there's a new normal. He suddenly realized it. The problem with this guy is that in one year, he did this questionnaire. Now this guy was serious about our questionnaires. He, he realized he had a good outcome. And he filled in his son and as an outcome test in one year and he put it out of five he did very well but he put like two three zero one one and then i was presenting my data at a, at a big international conference and the question i got in the audience was why would you operate on a patient that has a quality of life score of zero and he didn't have a problem that was the first embarrassing thing and the second was is you said that you had a 97.3 percent success rate how come that guy got worse so when you're just dealing with validated data, it could be that. So we actually had to take his data out as an exception or get him to retrospectively fill in a new validated score. But patients don't know any better. And yeah, that's why you pick up. He adapted well to the situation. He did, yeah. yeah. And he, he would tell you that he had a phenomenal outcome. We've got pre post operative objective data to show we've got a great outcome. But it's pretty hard to show if you're looking at validated subjective scores. And very finally, sometimes you do find the, the, the incidental obstruction. This is basically this guy. Um, so this is a dental guy, came to see us, absolutely angry. One, I probably kept him waiting in my rooms, but two, he doesn't know why he can't just go ahead and have his follow-up. There he had his, his implant done, and we looked in his nose, he had a nice big follow-up. Unfortunately for us, we were able to actually chop that out in the rooms, and it's really dead. So. And that's my friend, before, and that's his one-year follow-up. But look at this, you know, he was perfect before, and now I've made him less than perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, he has referred more patients to me than, than any other individual patients. And the irony, and the dentist keeps reminding he never had his implants in him. I don't know why. <laughs> so, what recommendations? Always be aware of potential sinus disease. Take a history with the CT scan. Always try to capture the maxillary outflow tract if you're doing cone beams in your room. Uh, look at the pattern because of congestion and always be happy to find a friendly ENT uh, uh, to share. If we do need to do something, let the ENT go first so we don't cause any ENT pathology. That's a true slide again, Jim. Sorry? True slide, the one before. And let's just read one. One more, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Very nice, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, any questions? Anybody online want to ask? Yeah. Did you say that there was no nerve damage for turbinoplasty? Um, so for our age, we, we don't interfere at, at till five with a formal turbinoplasty because uh, we, in my mind, at least that's when facial growth occurs. So you don't have to intervene too early. Some kids are gross nasal obstruction, so we do not formal turbinoplasty. We do what's called a copulation turbinoplasty. And the earliest I've done that is in an 18-month-old. Um, so I don't know if you saw the picture at the very beginning, I just mentioned it, it's a gross congestion, kid was struggling, so we do turbines. So we can address the turbines at a very young age. But if we do it just for dental, snoring, sleep, we will usually wait until they're five and can tolerate a nasonoscopy. So if a child won't let us go near them, if an eight-year-old won't let them go near me with, with, a, with, a, with a surgery, I won't do the surgery on them. 
but if a four and a half year old lets me put a camera in their nose, then we will do the surgery on them. The youngest so far has been five years and four months. Give four more children a class. Would you, in that case, consider doing um, tonsillectomy at an earlier age? And yeah, no, so I know tonsillectomy is a commonly done between age two and three. So remember, there's two different things. So often people mistake big tonsils and nasal obstruction. Big tonsils does not change your oral shape. Is not what we're talking about here. Big tonsils do contribute to snoring. So often dentists are looking and think, oh, big tonsils, that's causing high arch palate. That's not true. Big tonsils often associated with big animals. That's the only con connection. What I do is because I'm well known as a nose doctor and I do a lot of turbulent adenoids, we've actually got away in a lot of patients only addressing the nose and leaving the tonsils behind. This is a big movement in, in, in ENT now to do tonsillotomies. So you don't remove all the tonsils, you just take out some of the tonsils. You make some of them. And that works really well if you do something for the nose. So the whole key is that the nose is still the most important. Please don't be wrong, if a three-year-old comes with a history of sleep apnea or sleep study food and sleep apnea with grade three or four tonsils, we take them out. I've got a beautiful picture of showing the kids with the tonsils touching the midline. So we do them. But when a kid comes with a grade two tonsil, you know, but a very blocked nose, I'll often try to convince the mum to just deal with the nose. It's safer, quicker recovery. Adenoid in terms, doing it first, a kid will be back to school on a Monday. Tonsillectomy is two weeks of the parents hating you with a 1.8% risk of a bleed, 1 in 25,000 risk of death. Now, it's, you know, unfortunately, it's very, thankfully, it's very, very, very low. But there have been tonsil bleed deaths in Australia. There's probably been about four in the last 10 years in children. So it's not zero. Zero risk of death in adenoid internments. And even the big bleeds are on. So it's not the kind of bleed that can compromise the air like the tonsil bleed can. So as a naturally conservative person, if I can avoid taking up the tonsils, I would. But you have to make the assessment in every child. And in the allergy cases, um, where someone is actually using their nasals and their um, very regularly, um, will the turbulence slow down? Um, so not often, so we, I do a lot of forward, because I also, I do the terminal surgery, and then the kids are very allergic, so they have something with immunotherapy with me, that's a three year trial. We've got about five to six year data, still small studies on very allergic kids, and our, and our success rate's high, it's about 97%, but I quote lower, because I know, as with all of life, that as you watch your patients for longer, you get a higher failure rate. So we quote patients 95% uh, long term success rate, I'm seeing less than 3% failure, even in our allergic patients, providing they're well medically managed. We don't count a kid who's got terrible allergies, has an operation, does brilliant, disappears, comes back six years later, because unchecked, a lot of them will get a nasal obstruction, but they respond to medicines really well. So they come back not for more surgery, they come back for, we re-engage them medically, put them on fixed nose drops, talked about immunotherapy, introduced our MISTA, which is a very good combination, uh, antihistamine, uh, steroid combination and often will medically manage them. I do very, very few revision of turbinoplasties. Whereas the submucosal resections and the diathermy techniques, you know, it, it, was, it was temporary, it was like Botox, last six months. Any other questions? As speech therapist, do you guys see a lot of nasal obstruction? Yeah. We see sometimes kids who have the opposite problems coming from speech therapists. They think that half is up on a half nasal with uh, palatal issues. And that's always a trouble in, because the last thing we want to do is they make the nose more open. And uh, sometimes I'll send it back to speech therapists for correct half <laughs> nasality, providing there's no palatal issue, and then we'll turn it around and, uh, and then address the nose. Very challenging, those kids. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to all of this. Thank you, Derek, for being around for guiding me over again.